Welcome to Escaping Kerberos, the podcast where we rewatch, reminisce, and review everything Doctor Who from 2005 to present. My name is Rich, and I'm joined by someone who can smell David Tennant from miles off. It's Amy. Oh, that was a good one that time. I know. I was wondering <laughs> what to do for this one. Uh, I was. I had something else in mind. I was, I was thinking for it, thinking about this last like week or so as to how I can introduce you. And I can't think of what it was exactly. Something about glowing green or just being a weird mm. bitch. Something yeah, I prefer those lines. smelling David. And Tennant. then I realised, hang on a minute. I mean, <laughs> literally, what what was it you said when we were watching it? He started snogging Joan, and you said like, "Kiss me, daddy," or something. I said, "What did I say?" <laughs> I said something like, "Kiss me, big boy," or something. Yeah, oh like God, that. yeah. <laughs> and I know like she wasn't talking to me because she never refer- never refers to me as big boy. Sorry, pal. I'm a I'm a little. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna go. No, I'm not, no. I'm not gonna go into that. <laughs> Welcome back to Escape from Cerberus. The train has already left the rails, and it's all over the place. Bodies everywhere. Welcome to Human Nature and the Family of Blood. The penultimate sort of I say penultimate two parter because it's not a two parter we've got coming up. It's a three parter we've got coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's after next time, which we'll which we'll talk about at the end of the uh, at the end of this episode. Human Nature and Family of Blood. Which back in the day, twenty sixth of May two thousand and seven, wow. and the second and the second of June two thousand and seven. So we're just we're, we're like we've been so close to the release schedule, fifteen years ahead. Mm-hmm. Like it was only the other day that they were posting all over Doctor Who social saying it's been fifteen years since these episodes, and it's like yeah. fifteen years. Who boy, I am so old now. Um, yeah. Did you did you watch these episodes when they first released? Yes, I did. I distinctly remember this story, this plot being released, because I remember when the episode starts and he's all, I had a dream about you, Martha, and she's all correcting him. And I was like, is he been human this whole time? What the hell is going on? Oh, my God. Are they about to tell us that the entirety of Doctor Who has all been a dream? Oh, could you Uh, imagine? Yeah, lol. And it was all a dream. Oh, yeah, because that worked well for... Oh, what was it? I can't think of what it is. I can't remember. There's there's an American American drama sitcom that did a whole season. Dallas, I think it was. It was like, and it was all a dream. And everyone just went, oh, that's terrible. My English teacher used to say to us, she used to say, if you... If the only ending you can come up with is that it was all a dream, you're not a good writer. (laughs) <laughs> basically so why because... have we had a Chibnall story like that yet oh, oh shots oh. fired <laughs> oh. <laughs> pushing the boat out oh absolutely no, really <laughs> we're raising the bar here on Escaping Kostoberos <laughs> we're actually going to slag off Chris Chibnall for once um, <gasps> shock I think is I, I've said this before on EK that I grew up doing dance classes on Saturdays so the chances of me catching Doctor Who when I was growing up were very slim. And bear in mm-hmm. mind, this was for, for all you kiddies out there who've been, you know, rewatching Doctor Who for this podcast on the old iPlayer. Back in my day, that didn't exist. No. iPlayer was but a figment of my imagination. The dream of having a, a, a service to watch live TV back before we had Sky Plus, like mate. Yep. When we got Sky Plus, it was like the dog's bollocks. But it was oh, like same. I had to ask my uncle to tape Doctor Who for me, and I remember. I think I might I might have said this when we when we talked about um, Parting of the Ways at the end of series one, uh, where my uncle watched it and I didn't, and I I quizzed him on yeah. what he saw. Mm-hmm. Like, what was there this? Was there that? And he said there was a thing with one eye. I'm like, oh my god, it was Davros. Obviously, it wasn't, but yeah. I had to get my uncle to tape it for me, but. Human Nature, Family of Blood. I saw Family of Blood on release. I right. don't remember why I saw the second one or not the first one. Obviously, I wasn't doing dance classes that day or something. Maybe they got cancelled. I, I remember be, remember watching the uh, the first the, the 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 cold open running back the events of mm-hmm. uh, Human Nature and just being like, I yeah, I, I just, I'll go with this. I've got no clue what's going on. So I only saw like the second half of the action packed half of this right. this serial. And there are still elements of it that completely elude me, um, mm-hmm. which is always fun about doing a rewatch podcast because we get to look back at bits that we don't remember as fondly. There are some episodes we can recite by like word for word, yeah. and there are some that we just can't. Well, you can. And, well, I can. And as good as Human Nature and Family of Blood are, and I have watched them through a lot, it is still like watching them through for the first time. Mm-hmm. When I, these are the kind of episodes. Series three, weirdly, 
seems to be yeah. one that sort of eludes me. And, and and to be honest, kind of going forward as well, series one and two were the ones I watched like on repeat because well, they yeah. were like the only series I had on DVD. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, I brain, work, <laughs> words. I'm trying to like remember... But I'm I'm absolutely certain that I watched them at the time because I distinctly remember wondering why he was human. And I also distinctly remember never remembering, if you can get your head around that sentence, I distinctly remember never remembering how he tricks them at the end. Like, because when I was a kid and I watched this, I mean, how old, what was this, 2007? 2007, we were 12. So we'd, we'd just uh, we'd turned 13. 12. No, 12. No, I can't maths. we just we're turned 12. 12. <laughs> so I was just thinking, it's May. No, we're 12. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I could never quite understand his mumbo jumbo at the end of it about olfactory uh, perception and things like that. And now I understand he basically means he did a smell trick. <laughs> he, he masked his Time Lord Musk with a, a, a wet ripper. The uh, family of blood what? couldn't smell through. A wet ripper. Is have, that... you, have you never considered what a Time Lord fart would smell like? No. <laughs> yeah. I... <laughs> Let us know in the comment section below. What does a Time Lord... I mean, I'm sure there are some people out there who very much wanted to know what David Tennant's farts smell like. Yeah, but I'm hoping we don't attract that crowd. <laughs> <laughs> That's an odd Could be crowd. worse. They could be asking what our farts smell like. Anyway. That, yeah, no. No. Anyway... Uh, let's talk about this one. So, in a in a fun turn of events, uh, Human Nature and the Family of Blood is actually based on a novel from, yes. I think it's 1995, uh, which is written by Paul Cornell, who wrote this article, or wrote this, uh, sorry, wrote this novel, I I said article, wrote this novel in publication date, May 1995. Oh. So we were published at so, the same time. Um, yeah. We- <laughs> and he wrote this two-parter and it's it's a it's a direct well, I say direct. It's a it's about eighty percent from what I can see adapted from this novel into this TV uh serial mm-hmm. where the doctor finds himself being chased by um a bunch of aliens and has to disguise himself as a human Name John Smith, falls in love with Joan in a school in 1913. Like that, that's all very much the same. Obviously, rather than being Bernice Summerfield, it's Martha Jones. And yeah. it's not Sylvester McCoy, it's David Tennant. So it's it's not the first time we've had this happen in Doctor Who. This is the more this is the more direct uh mm-hmm. version of or the more a more direct adaptation, I should say, of you know the wider doctor who media that got adapted into tv stuff yeah. um the first of which being dalek from 2005 being adapted from jubilee which is mm-hmm. a, which is a sixth doctor big finish audio drama from i can't i think it's i think it's like 2001 2002 it might even be later than that I'm i think quite might, impressed i'm gonna check this now I just typed in Jubilee 2004. It's literally oh. the it, it's literally the platy jubes right now. Platy jubes, uh, please. Platy jubes. I hate that so <laughs> much. I can't even explain. 2003. How f- unfathomable my hatred is for the word platy jubes. Happy platy jubes, everyone. It's disgusting. Yeah, I know. It was written by Robert Sherman in 2003, so it was the same writer of Dalek, but released two years prior. And right. Jubilee form the basis of Dalek where it, it it bears very little resemblance to Dalek whereas the human nature novel bears a lot more resemblance to the t- to the TV yeah. adaptation so well yeah to and be fair and, if you've got something excellent why not if you if you've already written a Doctor excellent. Who novel why not just adapt it into a into a thing mm-hmm. so yeah why not do that and I've not I've not read the novel personally it might be an interesting read but um after looking things up about it, it seems to very much cover the same ground. And it's I've listened to Ju- and I've listened to Jubilee, so I know that it doesn't adapt into Dalek one to one. But yeah, that's interesting all the same. So, long story short, the Doctor's ch- being chased by the family, bunch of aliens who want his life force to be- to live forever. The Doctor becomes human by making himself go owie in a chameleon arch, and Martha has to babysit him as John Smith in a making school in nineteen thirteen. Go owie. 
Yes. <laughs> I, am, I mean, I will say one I'm thing. I'm so is eloquent. The scenes where David has to be in pain are always weirdly uncomfortable, but not uncomfortable because he's in pain. It's just a bit... It's Because you look at it and you think, he's having to just sit there and scream. Scream. That yeah. must be... I mean, as actors on set and as professionals working in that industry, you know that they will all take that seriously. They won't, they won't sort of point and laugh as much as you might yeah. have that concern. Like when you're doing it in a school play and you know you've got the kids who are sat there laughing at you because you're pretending to be hurt. Well, I can yeah. F- I, that's the first thing you probably feel if you get told, right, you have to be very, very owie. Yeah. <laughs> Right owie. Now. Owie. Um, I did a drama where I live on, that's a technical term. Um, yeah. Whereas, obviously, in that in that instance, when you're doing it professionally for a TV series that's very, very popular, you know, mm-hmm. you won't get given that same sort of grief for well, sitting there screaming. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, speaking of, of, of Tennant being asked to do things that you probably could find quite funny, um, you, talk, you mentioned while we were watching about how Doctor Who Confidential showed the the actors learning how to walk like the scarecrows yeah i distinctly remember that part of confidential with them talking to the actors and being like right we're gonna show you how we all walk as scarecrows and then sort of acting how they like flail their arms around to the side and it's like swing that, their legs out wide and it's act like that scene in shawn of the dead when they protect when they they're in the back garden trying to be zombies yeah. and that's a fun fact because uh thingy majobby what's her name Thingy, oh jumpy. crikey jessica hines is in uh shawn of the dead who's jessica hines who plays joan oh i thought i recognized her yeah, from yeah. something she does she's uh she was in spaced as well so she's done lots of stuff with um uh edgar simon wright Peg. and simon Pegg. Ah. so that's why she, she's in all three of the cornetto films as well if i remember yeah early. oh cool she in, she in the world's end i assume i don't know i'm going to I've assume she once. is Probably. you've only seen it once yeah, you've shown it to me once, so I've watched oh, it once. <laughs> I need to watch that again. Uh, is she in The World's End? She's got to be in The World's End. I don't know. She's she very pretty. She is not in The World's End. But she's in Shaun of the Dead. I okay. thought she was in Hot Fuzz. Who knows? But apparently not. Anyway, but she's, yeah. So that's a fun little link for you. But oh, okay. in terms of the, like confidential, when the Doctor is on the screen in the TARDIS talking to Martha... Mm-hmm. saying about, you know, one, you need to do this, two, then four, oh no, wait, three, then four, and so on. When she fast forwards in Confidential, they actually show a clip. I think it might also be on YouTube, actually, like the... Probably. The sort of the whole uncut thing they recorded with David Tennant to for that, that I was going to say VT, I've been doing too much. Oh, do you know, stuff. I think I remember this. He was he sits giving there and he, saying he loads says, of random things, He just he? goes, right, and now that's the end of my script, and I need to say silly words, dingle, dangle, doodle, and he just starts saying loads of random stuff. He talks about <laughs> I how... I think I remember I'm that. I'm pretty certain he says, and he ad-libs this, and I'm, it must have been latched upon from Moffat when he gave um, Capaldi his final speech as the Doctor because he said about not eating pears. Right. And he says, like, please don't let me eat pears. Pears are gross. And obviously... Capaldi like it is says never ever eat pears in his final yeah. speech. So there's that whole thing as well. Whereas that would have been something where hats off to Tennant, where he has to sort of stand he has there to and act just ad lib mm-hmm. loads of random nonsense so that Martha's got something to fast forward through. Yeah. It's I like do from enjoy a, that. From a technical perspective, they could have just looped, like taken mm-hmm. a chunk of that audio or that video and just looped it over and over again to then fast forward through it but then you probably would have noticed that like not when it's being, viewers, not when it's being like, fast forwarded eagle eyed viewers like you would have done because you would be the exact person to sit there and go do you know what's funny is if you watch that closely you can actually see they've just looped the same section of the footage oh to you would be, be a that video person. editor for a profession you would be that person yeah I know. so I'm glad they didn't and also it gives you a fun little but, like that's a fun, that, but that's a fun little thing. Like, if you can find it, if you can watch The Confidential somehow, like, we, as I said before, we've been watching these in the, uh, the Doctor Who Steelbooks, um, which I've been picking up. And I, I discovered, on a, very, on a quick side note, mentioning the Steelbooks, I discovered that even though they re-released them all the way up to Series 8, I think? Yeah. 9, 10, 11, 12, and... 9, 12, sorry, 9, 10, 11, and 12, and technically 13 as well, they weren't re-releasing them. They were just filling in the blanks that didn't have steelbooks. So if I wanted to go and get the rest of the steelbooks, I'd have to go on eBay and pay 
ludicrous money for them. Oh, so basically all the ones that already existed as steel books when they they're were not released, doing again. they're not well, going to... Oh, well, I would say they're not doing them again. They might do, but it's been it's been a while since the most recent one. Yeah. And normally they release two or three of them a year, and I don't even know when the last one came out. So have you got all of them up to... I have got series one to eight, so Capaldi's right. first series, and I have I have got Flux on a steel book. Ugh. So I'm missing 9, 10, 11, and 12. I'm only missing four. Okay. But if you I might wanted be able to, to find them. I, I might be able to find them on eBay, but, if, but bear in mind, if I go on like Amazon, there's people obviously reselling on Amazon, they go for like 80 quid a pop. Yeah, that's Amazon because, though. eBay people are a lot fairer with their prices. Yeah, I need to have a look, but it's like, I ah, would. dang it. I w- yeah, but anyway, the, the, all the confidentials are on those steelbooks. So if you get the chance to go and watch the confidentials again, or you might be the kind of person, the absolute baller that has Doctor Who Confidential on a disc, because oh I think God. I'm pretty certain when they did some of the series, the old series, like DVD box sets, they gave you the confidentials on there as well. If any of you listening have any shred of any like recording or dvd pressing of confidential please let us know because i miss that like I mean, that show them. was incredible well that's the thing the mute no but uh, we just... have the shortened versions oh yeah but the thing is i don't know whether they br- whether they actually did do again this is where people in in the comments or on twitter could actually con- con- like correct us on this i don't recall them ever putting the full length confidentials on a disc Oh, unless you had. got unless you got like an original pressing i say pressing you said pressing as well i said pressing that's a vinyl term but you know what you mean unless an original you got copy an original copy of, like the uh the original imagine um, if somebody series. has an entire vhs collection that they've like recorded at home i wouldn't be surprised and i would love to that. you if you do because uh, it's like i distribute it i still Don't. have my original um i say this before i have my original eccleston episodes on dvd the first releases of them when they released them in four parts mm-hmm. so as soon as they aired the first like four episodes they released the first four episodes of dvd i still have those they yeah. look like crap and you can tell they got played to death because oh, they yeah. did because it's me but it's like, like they, didn't, my... they didn't have confidential on them um, yeah but it was like if you bought that box set if, if do you remember ames mm. the original series one box set came in like a tardis shaped box Mm, no because we never bought the dvds fair enough some people who are listening might remember that but i'm pretty certain i think it was only things like that that had the confidentials with them as well mm. in the same way that these special edition steelbooks have the confidentials with them as well and then they did doc 2 extra and then yeah, they killed which it off. wasn't as good well actually they killed it off for a i think they killed it off sort of through capaldi's era and then yeah, when they it had was jody's first extra. series they did a they did a thing on YouTube, yeah. That was kind of like a success to the confidential, but it did it, it cover next good. to nothing. Yeah. But then, as we talked about last time, the fact that we know that obviously Tennant and Tate and um, Yasmin Finney are all filming for the 60th at the moment. There were cameras going around, and David Tennant was like waving at them and talking to the camera. So it's like, oh my god, is Russell bringing back Doctor Confidential? Oh my is god, so please! Okay? I mean, there was a, uh, right just as another thing. There's a, um, uh, <laughs> I saw this on Twitter, and I had to go and look at it. Somebody supposedly leaked stuff on Reddit about Doctor Who series 14 and the special. Oh no! And it's like there are st- some of the opening comments like oh, i've got somebody who works at bad wolf and i've got some insider information it's like yeah bollocks do you yeah of course it's you like have. it's like when it's when there's a, a state of play or a nintendo direct and somebody goes look i got a leak and it's like here's a blurry picture of a screen showing microsoft word it's like yeah nice try mate mm. but going down this list somebody uh, had, had gone down and, and just said like here's this here's that here's the other and it's like well this is all complete rubbish like there's some mm. absolute mad things like Oh, the the mox was it the mox of Balhoon or Banakaf Alatas coming back? What I thought and they both like, died. Yeah, and stuff like that. And it's like okay, that's complete rubbish. And then one of the things was that they were like, oh, Doctor Doctor Confidential is coming back, but it's being hosted by like a bunch of, it's like changing up every week, and people are like different like YouTube personalities are hosting Doctor Confidential each week, and somebody and like, um, uh, Dominic G Martin, who is a very popular Doctor Who cosplayer and he also works for Big Finish now as a producer which is really really oh, cool. cool so he, he was like oh I'm apparently hosting Doctor Who Confidential according to these leaks and then somebody tweeted me like yo I'd like to see Rich host it so it's like <laughs> yeah, all right. Dominic if you're listening I, I don't I doubt you are but if you were 
Should we host Doc Two Confidential together? Because I'm aware Do of that. it. I'd Do be it. totally okay with that. I just Yo. get to sit there and fangirl the entire time. Can you time. imagine? Oh my god, it'd be so good. <laughs> I mean, it's a great idea. Yeah. I think it's a great oh, idea yeah. getting like the, the community in. Because it's kind of like the Doc Two, the community show that um, mm-hmm. uh, Crystal D used to host back in the Matt Smith and Capaldi era. It might have been Capaldi era, actually, that they hosted the community show, which was like a fan based right. thing. Yeah. But yeah, that that's a big segue, <laughs> I realise. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's it. Go watch The Confidential. Go see I David Tennant act like a Muppet to camera for like, I think it's like seven or eight minutes long of him just chatting complete nonsense until he gets right to the end to say thank you. So Yeah, I would watch that. Yeah. We'll have to share, um, I'll tell you what, yeah. we'll have to share a link on the old the old Twitter, at Castapod, and I might have just tweeted that picture of Novice Haim. <laughs> Why? Because <laughs> it was funny. Um, Before we started recording, Rich sent me a picture of Novice Haim that I'm sure we've discussed on here before, where she looks really gammy. It's from the Doc 2 experience or one of the old She's convent- got the old fake eyes that look really gross, and it just about, the original picture that he sent me, it just made its way off my Discord chat with him that we call on for these recordings. And then he goes and sends me another one. And You're welcome. I dislike him for it. It was in my clip board i pasted it on twitter so yeah i'll have to dig out that uh, that video and and post it on the old twitters um but yeah so we're 22 we... minutes in should we actually talk about the episode yeah let's talk about the episode so <laughs> going through this uh this two part of this cereal a lovely word mm. um the thing oh, that now I... I want cereal shut up <laughs> the price <laughs> i'm the... hungry <laughs> The main thing for me, that going back to to human nature and the family of blood that I appreciate the most, there are there are little things like how we never see the true form of the family, mm-hmm. which I really like. What yeah, was I like that, that. What was it that we watched where they where we shouldn't have seen their true form? Um, was it? Doctor Who related or was it? Yeah, it was Doctor Who related. I swear something we watched either in the last either in on Escaping the Debris or it might have been part of the part of my like, like episode series thirteen on or what have yeah. you. Just something where I've there seen, was like I think I know what you're on about, but I can't place I can't pinpoint it. it. There but was like the something idea that, that we discussed that was like we should never have seen that it would have been better off as a anonymous entity. As an example, like for example like, like in when they showed the weeping angels move. Yeah. It's like, they shouldn't have done that. It removes yeah, what all... was it? I feel like maybe it, sh- it would have been something on the podcast because we wouldn't probably wouldn't have discussed something in that much detail I'm unless it was flux it was. related. I don't um, know, because we don't, we don't lead into too, like talking about the modern series too much, at least in like detail. Like EK no, no, detail. not on the podcast, but just in general. Uh, I'm trying to general. think what it would be. Unless it was related to one of the most recent episodes. I don't know. But either way, like if... It feels like that it would have been a, a mistake to actually show what the family look like because that that element of the unknown works so well in Doctor Who, just leaving yeah. it completely up to the imagination. And, and also, for some reason, all of those actors and actresses that played the family just are so incredibly good at looking ridiculously creepy. Yeah, I mean, so as an example, Harry Lloyd plays Baines. Yeah, just and... creepy off the bat. Yeah, a, a, an incredibly creepy guy. And the thing that I'm, I'm just looking at is um, his Wikipedia page at the moment. And um, you, know, you look at his all of his work, like he's continued to work and stuff like that. But mm. it feels like he should have gone on to become that proper stereotypical villain character that gets yeah. cast in everything. Yeah, kind of yeah. like how you've seen Chronicle, that found footage superhero film. Mm, is that the one you forced me to watch? I probably once? made you watch it years ago. Mm, probably. There's an, a- there's an actor in that called Dane DeHaan. Okay. And he went on to play Harry Osborn in the Amazing Spider-Man films. I know you haven't seen the Amazing Spider-Man films. No, I haven't. They're the one but, Spider-Man films I yeah, haven't watched. He pl- he ended up playing... Like, he was such a good... Like, he he turned very villainous in Chronicle. And right. because of that turn as being this villainous character, it seems like Hollywood just went, this guy's a, a good villain. villain. So when they cast him as Harry Osborn, who be- Harry Osborn, who becomes like the new Goblin in the Amazing Spider-Man films, it was like the perfect casting. And for somebody like Harry Lloyd, 
after watching him in Doctor Who, it feels like that should have been what he did. He got that step up to really go on to become this sort of much bigger yeah. villain. Not that he's not done, like, anything. He's done a lot, but... It's like the woman who is in Midnight. I can't remember. I don't know her actress's name. She's called Sky, isn't she? Sky. I can literally never see her as anything other yeah. than a evil wrongdoer. Um, and, yeah, in some things, she's a really nice character and yet i just see her as this evil bitch like i literally can't look at her and not think she's horrible but he was he was in game of thrones actually oh he played this 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 targaryen (laughs) targaryen is how you pronounce the last name but i don't know how to pronounce no neither do i i don't know how to pronounce the first name but i know it's targaryen he's done a bunch of stuff but like he's he is so good the way that he sort of holds his mouth off to uh-huh. the right the whole time. Yeah, and just, that... I and always he, thought he literally, he was like, like never blinks. He never blinks. Mm-hmm. And he is so... Like, he's already a very ruthless character before he becomes part of the family, but afterwards, he is just... He's perfect. Yeah. And I... I as a... If I were casting something and I, I need this creepy, unnerving villain that doesn't... Like, you, you don't ever have any kind of feeling of understanding or remorse for you just want someone who looks scary and just is scary you get harry lloyd in. oh and yeah I'm surprised, he's the person. I'm, I'm surprised he didn't go on after doing a role like that where he was so good to go on and do even more than that yeah maybe i mean maybe he decided he didn't want to be typecast as a villain which is fair i mean that is also fair he, he's you know he's done a bunch of stuff um rebecca staten who is plays... another she plays jenny jenny was that her name yeah 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 um she Jen- is also brilliant because it, unlike the the obviously the, the the girl daughter of mine we don't see really see her prior to being no. taken same with the bloke as well mm-hmm. um bane's very much remains the same kind of sinister sneery kind of person yeah and whereas jenny she she becomes this complete opposite of herself. i was gonna say i think you're about to say what i'm gonna say which is i just i find her incredible because she literally goes from being the friendly bubbly cutesy like dare i say it kind of round faced like welcoming yeah. you know friendly type which i think is the polar opposite to baines in that yeah. he's got a very pointy very jarring look like he's you know very kind of sticky out rat faced and she's very like round faced very cuddly very kind of warm she gives off that vibe yeah. And she's like Martha's like really good friend in all of this and then at all no of a sudden point, at, yeah, at no point do you ever think she could be bad. Yeah. I know that then, obviously within the, the the concept of this story, no one just is secretly bad. It's yeah. it's very much worn on your sleeve, but you see her and you're just like as much as because she's Martha's friend, you know stuff's gonna go down with her, but you don't ever have that inkling of like, you could be bad. Mm, but then Whereas even watch, watching this back, I didn't remember that she was the one who turned into mother yeah, of mine. You like, thought it was it just the three just of them because she's late. Took me by surprise. Um, and uh, and yeah, she just ha- managed to just completely switch that between being warm, friendly to being cold and evil. And I think that just shows her range like completely within that one episode. The thing that I... The, 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 the defining moment for Jenny's character, for the mother of mine and the way that she the way that uh, Rebecca Staten does actually make that that click and that that so apparent like okay I'm switching over to evil now is right at the end of episode one where she does that line where she she's like walking towards Martha mm-hmm. or walking towards David Tennant either either of them and she's obviously looking directly down the lens of the camera and she says all that ah, screaming and like the way she delivers that line I'm like Oh my god, you are horrible. Yeah, I think that's episode <laughs> two. It might be, it might be episode it's right two. right at the start it's, of the second part, it's yeah. At that, it's at that main point, the, yeah, at the yeah. dance, which which obviously bridges both episodes. It's, it's that line, I'm just like, oh my god, you are mm-hmm. so good. Because you don't, there is literally not an, not, a, not an ounce of Jenny left. She yeah. is fully, fully different. Like, Baines is scary because he's a scary guy. 
but it makes the family more scary when you see how much it changes Jenny, the way mm-hmm. that she manages to put across this 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 maniacal, sinister side of the family being yeah. the same actor. The way that there is not like it, it very much says there is nothing left of this person before. Mm-hmm. And it's great. Yeah, and I love what I also love about it is the fact that Martha is straight away able to figure it out from her when she is instantly sitting down to tea and she's like, hmm, I'll put some sardines and jam in the pot. And she's like, yeah, that sounds great. And it's like, Martha's like, yeah, no, you're not Jenny. Bye. I'm out. Done. Yeah. See you later. <laughs> it's like Martha's obviously on edge anyway. And because she's obviously, she knows that something's coming and it, it's mm-hmm. really good to see that she's super duper on it. She's always aware. She doesn't have to run around after the doctor and keep an eye out for... yeah the family these these creatures is, that are coming to get her this is one of those instances where i feel like martha off screen doesn't get as much credit as she does on screen because yep. she's clearly in the time that she's had off screen in between the last adventure and which i'm not gonna lie i can't even remember what the last adventure was 42 now. that's the one um <laughs> in between 42 and now she's clearly a lot has happened that she's sort of had to adapt to and also just their general adventures off screen that we obviously don't see that they allude to a yeah. lot in the in the tenant era um so she's getting to grips now with her character is becoming more and more involved in um the TARDIS lifestyle, a bit like how Rose's character developed throughout the series and we saw her eventually adapt to basically become the Doctor's, doctor's secondary. Martha is definitely getting much, I'd say she's at least sort of 80-90% there now to becoming the Doctor's sort of, you know, proper uh, right-hand man. And we definitely yeah. see that in the way that she behaves in this episode because although she's questioning what to do because he's fallen in love with someone. <clears throat> Excuse me. She's not questioning what to do for the sake of, like, saving everyone or being kind of the quote-unquote hero, etc. Um, she's fully involved in everything she has to do to save the day. It's purely just, oh, you never told me you were going to fall in love with someone, boo-hoo. <laughs> and then so, she just has the whole, I love you as well. Like, ah. Uh. And you know we've, we've we've definitely rattled on about Martha's love a lot, mm-hmm. and it's it's definitely a case of yeah, let's let's just dick punch Martha a bit with the Doctor falling in love with Joan, which, as said, that was part of the novel anyway. Yeah. So it was kind of it worked quite well. The stars kind of aligned to be like, okay, let's make Martha feel bad mm-hmm. because this is a this is a a story arc that we know is probably irking people in the same way it does us, and it probably did for people back then if they read I into actually, that. Yeah, I think. I think it's genuinely one of the things I really enjoy about this serial is kind of just getting to see how the kind... It's really difficult to put into words, but I really enjoy the emotional turmoil that the Doctor goes through as John Smith and to see him kind of have to grapple with the idea of do I give up my life for his like which is more important like why don't I get a chance and that really emotional scene where he's just crying into Joan about the fact that he doesn't want to go and this kind of thing and she is right I think she was very much right when she said he's braver than you like you chose to change but he chose to die kind of thing it's she's honestly probably one of my favourite uh, one-off characters. One-shot companions, yeah. Because she really doesn't take any crap. She's very much, like, head where it needs to be. She's down to earth. Yeah. She understands what needs to be done. Even and... with the ridiculousness of aliens and stuff, she knows everything yeah. aligns and she believes it because every single fact of what surrounds her, she's like, okay, this is actually happening. Mm-hmm. I don't like it. But it is happening. Yeah. But yeah, you make a good point about tenant about tenant about the doctor and John Smith because that's looking back at this this serial. That's the thing that I find the most fascinating about it. Obviously, the concept is really interesting, mm-hmm. um, 
and having the family being so ruthless and stuff. Yes, the, the shooting people and making them dissolve is always quite scary. Yeah. But there's, I think there's a but lot more. But I feel more. like that's the very alien-y for the sake of being family show and alien-y. It's, it's like the scarecrows as well. It's like in the grand scheme of things, did they need to have the scarecrows as the the sort of the more marketable and traditional villain of the week? Mm-hmm. Not really. That's like an added bonus. That's the yeah. thing where they can say here's the scarecrows that are here to scare the kids because just somebody acting creepy can be scary, but the the actual creepy visuals of those horrible looking scarecrows, they're they're the things that will get the kids frightened. Um, But the main thing to look at in in this two-parter is when it's one of the best things about uh, modern Who, especially post-Time War, is when they make the Doctor look at themselves Mm-hmm. When they show, they, they hold up a mirror and there is this reflection of what the Doctor sees. You get an essence of it come the end of Series 4 in jo- uh, Stolen Earth and Journey's End. Yeah. With Davros being like, look at all your companions. Look at all, look at how they've all become warriors for you. Mm-hmm. And you get that, you know, the Doctor sees the Doctor. The best thing about this, as you said, was the fact we have John Smith. We have this human who is destined to be the Doctor and not wanting to be. Mm-hmm. You have characters like Clara Oswald, who just who pines to be the Doctor, to, who just wants to be that kind of Annoyingly presence. Annoyingly so, so. To hold themselves so highly, so so like, highly regarded and so clever and be the centre of attention. They're, you have the characters who want to be like that. You have Martha who wants to be with him. You have Rose that, that falls in love with him. It's a little bit, their dynamic's a bit different. But then you have it where this person is going to become the Doctor, yeah. And they only know whispers and and dreams and they're not fully convinced it's real. And even just that like diluted amount of a Time Lord's life and he's like, nah, mate, I'm mm-hmm. good. No, thank you. And yeah, and it's really difficult to almost kind of watch someone have to go through that to give up the life that they are so vehemently in love with at that time it would be like asking you to suddenly run away and become somebody entirely different you know what i mean like you would just don't offer me that shut up (laughs) don't look at me like you would take it okay you love me shut up don't say anything (laughs) um but it would be it would be like asking everyone to give up the lives that they love so much and basically saying you can never come back like ever um and I think he plays it really, really well because none of us really know what that would be like. And yet he's so convincing. It's amazing to think that, obviously it's a testament to how good of an actor David Tennant really is, is how how different it is when he holds himself playing John Smith versus playing the Doctor. Right mm-hmm. at the end, when obviously he's misleading the family, as soon as he walks back into that ship, you know that he's pretending. Yeah. There's just tiny little things in the way he holds himself, the way he... he his, his diction it's different it's ever mm-hmm. so slightly different to how he did it as a human john smith that you know that he's misleading them because there, there is that that tiny little difference there and as you say when he's there when he's tasked with that decision people are dying yeah the, the family's closing in it's it's now or never what are you going to do mm-hmm. and he breaks down he has those visions of him and joan in the future and it's heartbreaking yeah and obviously being no, not even like having seen the episodes before but you know with the show it wasn't going to end any other way well yeah but it's still heartbreaking to see that and and being shown a side of the character that is true yeah that's the, that's the thing that's the harshest about this same with when we get davros doing the same thing to him at the end of the se- at the end of series four spoilers mm. but like you get you have to look at the doctor in a different light it's not a false light he's not being lied to he's not being misled this is genuinely what his life is it's when martha says you know the doctor's sorry john smith is questioning her like why are you here and she says Mm -hmm. because he's lonely it's like well yeah he is and why would you you, but then he's like why would you want me to be that person like i'm not lonely i have somebody i'm falling in love with i could have a family i could have like my whole life and it's i think what's worse is the fact that you know he has that choice to make and he could genuinely live that life if he wanted to and he was very close to yeah. And at no point do you really have, I mean, as much as obviously come the end of the series, Martha's like, do you know what? I'm good. See ya. You don't have companions who see him in that same way that he sees himself mm-hmm. on like a subconscious level. You know, we know the doctor is full of regret, um, yeah. which we'll get to come the day of the doctor. 
you know, the doctor is plagued with, with demons from his past. Mm -hmm. But the, the companions, the people he sees, they don't see that. They see this marvelous superhero. Yeah. Whereas this superhero is very much broken inside and there's no better person to see that than himself. And this and is the way that he gets he, he gets opened up and he sees it from a completely different perspective. Even if the Doctor within, or the Doctor within the watch doesn't know that this person would, mm -hmm. would kick off. To see it from a viewer perspective, to see it from Martha's perspective, it's hard. Yeah, and also it's when Joan, right at the end... The last, one of the last things she says to him is, if you had not come here on a random whim, would people have died? And you know that the answer doesn't even have to be given. As an audience, you know that answer is no. And you just see his face drop because he knows that the answer is quite simply no, they wouldn't have done because pain and death just seems to follow me everywhere. And she just manages to pick up on that so kind of eloquently that you don't really... It's not really poignant until exactly when she says it. But as soon as she says it, you understand her viewpoint in yeah. that she loved the man who refused to send those kids to battle real people like as soon as they found out they were scarecrows and that they hadn't actually ever killed anyone the delight in their voices was like so we haven't killed anyone and he was yeah. like so intent on not letting them actually shoot anyone why do you think and, he stands there with his rifle well, and doesn't yeah, fire not a shot shoot as anything and it's so that whole sequence is so good as well um I'd just like to point out, like, the acting in that sequence with all the boys crying and everything. Just, like, that is really, really well done by the Doctor Who team at kind of putting into perspective how young men at the time must have felt about fighting and going to war. Um, and, uh, yeah, she so she falls in love with the John Smith that wouldn't sacrifice anybody. And as soon as she sees the Doctor and says, would you ever change back? And he says, no, you know her mind's made up already because... He, not that he lets people die, but it just happens to be that people die and he happens to be at the center of a lot of it. Um, and I think as a viewer, that's something that is quite obvious to us in that, yes, okay, a lot of death follows him around. And that is obviously a lot of what the whole thing with Rose being lost at the end of this series was that he didn't want her to die. So he sent it to a parallel universe and that kind of thing. Um, but it's it's an in an, an oh my god that sentence it's an inevitable fact that when you travel with the doctor you witness death and death happens and yeah. often you also die as a companion um but it's having it put into perspective by somebody that has viewed it for only i mean Bear in mind, for two months of this whole thing, Joan thought she was he was John Smith. She had no inkling whatsoever to anything else. And then all of this happens within 48 hours, I think. Yeah. Maybe 24. Who knows how fast 48. this all happens. Um, yeah. And so within 48 hours, she goes from being the person who's in love with John Smith to the person who knows that john smith can truly never exist again and i think it's, honestly her story is more heartbreaking than his it's a it's a horrible uh parallel to her losing her husband mm -hmm. being shot in france whatever it was like she went yeah. from having this love of her life to within however many hours bada boom he's gone that's it end mm -hmm. of he's not coming back hence probably why she asks you know is this going to hurt in the same way you know can he come back technically yes Will he come back? No. No. Not happening, love. Sorry. So yeah. she, she has that she has that pain twice. And I almost feel it was kind of short sighted of the doctor to say, you know, come with me. Mm-hmm. Where it very much was. That's probably more the the you know, the alien side of the doctor, which we very much get more of that in the Moffat era of this not understanding humanity thing. Mm -hmm. Um where, where the doctor had just been like, come with me. And at no point did he necessarily think, but she doesn't like you. She uh -huh. likes the old you. Yeah. And, and I get that he probably does that as, a, as, as some kind of like, 
I can I can try and make this better for you rather than leave you completely by See, yourself. But... I don't know. I honestly think what I read out of that whole scene of him asking her to go with him is that he's still in love with her. I think part of him hang, yeah. has hung on to that feeling that John Smith had for her and he wants to try and have just that kind of simple life with her. But even... Like you said, I think it's him being short-sighted and I think it's him being quite selfish, actually, because I actually think that one of the things that's so good about David's Doctor is just how much he understands humans and their emotions. You don't... Like, Matt Smith is completely the opposite in that he's basically the alien that doesn't understand all these human things and football and all these weird things, like, you know, that he gets into. But I think David Tennant is very much plays a different character of the Doctor, which is that he truly understands the way people are and yeah okay he's a man so he's gonna miss things you know Uh, but that's just i think brilliant script writing on russell's part in that obviously he missed the fact that martha was in love with him or maybe he didn't and he's just he's aware of it but he doesn't want it to be a thing um but i think he very much dropped the what's dropped the ball drop the ball is that the phrase he very much dropped the ball on this one in asking her to go with him because if he'd have thought about it for two minutes and realised that his own, that him requesting her to come with him was quite a selfish desire of his, he would have realised that actually this is not, this is not what she wants and this is not what I should be asking. And I think he realises that on his walk back to the TARDIS, which we obviously don't see, but when he gets back to Martha and she says, maybe I could go and talk to her. She's desperate for him to be happy, even if it's not with her. And he... He says it, he says it's time to move on and you know, you can see it in his face and the way he portrays that sentence, those two two lines of it's time to move on and the different um, inclinations he gives to each of those lines. It's very kind of poignant that he's realised in that moment that actually he's he's done. Like that side of, that John Smith side can never be intertwined with the Doctor. And I think he knows that, you know, I don't know whether maybe if the Doctor had been the Doctor the entire time, maybe people wouldn't have died. But I think he understands that there is every chance that they would have as well. Yeah. And it's... Finally. Yeah. Before we get on to some questions, we need to quickly talk about Tim. Oh, Timothy. Timothy! Thomas Sangster, who you've seen in everything, who, despite being 32 now... Still looks about twelve. Yeah, he him. always will. But he's done. He's done tons of stuff. And the fact you see him in Doctor Who, it's it's kind of like a, it's a rite of passage as a, uh, uh, as a British actor, I guess. Young British actor appearing in Doctor Who and going from there. We see him. He's the kid from Love Actually. He did Maze Runner. He did oh, all sorts of yeah, stuff. Yeah, of course yeah. he did. And obviously, he plays this 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 kid with a obviously a slight psychic like ability hence why you can he understood that boy's letter was about mm-hmm. africa he just sort of knew and how the, he could hear the watch and so on and so forth and obviously he has this this premonition and i don't know whether the doctor gives him the watch because he's like oh you know you were you were great here you go have this or whether he there was a part of the doctor that knew because he could hear the watch he's like yeah i feel like There's this might come and help this. you mm-hmm. in the future because he's he probably overheard maybe the doctor obviously remembers everything he did as John Smith, and he knows that he says to what's it, you know, we're gonna be on the battle on the battlefield together. Mm-hmm. It's like maybe this is something that could help him, and obviously that leads into his um, him surviving the First World War and being at that remembrance service. I also think that maybe partly the doctor already knew that the reason he needed to give him the fob watch because they obviously turned up at the memorial service, so yeah. he probably already knew that that was what he needed to do. And obviously, um, he, the, the John Smith knew that he was clever, but was holding back. Mm-hmm. So it's like, there was that essence of, I know you are really, really good. Like, really, really good. And I keep mentioning the stuff he did. He was Ferb. He was Ferb? Yes. In Phineas and Ferb? Yes, he was. Get out. No. Yo. And I'm pretty certain, just on the top of oh Phineas God, and Ferb. Oh my God, yeah. If you picture his, his voice, I can literally see him doing it. Yep. His dad um, was played by Richard O'Brien. What, Ferb's dad? 
You know the parent of Phineas, no the, the dad of Phineas Fennel is Richard O'Brien. Get out. I think oh it, I'm pretty certain it is. I'll have to check this now. Yo. That's incredible. Uh, I know, it's great, isn't it? I love that. Yes, oh it is Richard God. O'Brien. Oh That's my really God. cool. Um, so, right. Uh, let's let's move over to some questions. And if you, in case you didn't notice, and a few people did, if you listen to Escaping Gustavus on Spotify, which I know that the vast majority of you do based on our analytics, mm-hmm. um, now I can add questions to the podcast's uh, page listing. Yeah, the page on Spotify. So I can put in the question and say, next up is this. Do you have any questions? So now you can actually submit questions for the podcast on Spotify itself. So say if you don't use Twitter or you don't want to use Twitter and you, you, you listen to the podcast through Spotify, uh, you can do it straight through there instead. Yeah, so I think really if cool. you are, if you click on the podcast playlist and then say you're listening to the most recent episode, if you click on the title of the most recent episode, it will bring you to a, an individual page that is just that episode on the page. Where it would say like play and then you can scroll down and it says like Q&A. That kind of thing. So if you want to ask a question on Spotify, you can now. So that's that's really cool. So I've got a couple of questions off the uh, the old Spotify page because people did notice, which is actually kind of surprising. Cool. I thought I thought no one would notice it, but lo and behold, yeah. they did. And there's a bunch of ones on uh, Twitter as well. And the first one, because we just spoken about Tim, is from Cameron, and he asks. He says, obviously Tim's story uh, has a really emotional journey with that ending on Remembrance Day. But do you think he would have made a good companion? Could maybe see him and Ten having a cute father-son type of dynamic based on what we saw of their interactions in the episode? Um, I don't know, because I think the reason he is as good as he is within the episode is probably down to the fact that he's got that psychic premonition with the watch. Mm-hmm. Um, If he was just a standard lad, I don't think he would have been quite the same i mean he's very clever obviously we've just established that and obviously the doctor sees that within him even when he's john smith but i think his abilities are kind of superseded by the fact that he has that psychic connection which obviously we know disappears so i don't know i like the fact that he was only in one episode i think yeah i think because of his psychic ability it would have become a bit of a crux Mm-hmm. in terms of episodes going forward because it would almost need to be acknowledged and it would yeah. be the kind of thing that people would pick up on if there was nothing about it because it's so heavily prominent through this two-parter if all of a sudden it was like ta-da it's, it's gone it's like remember ryan has dyspraxia yeah no you don't because you barely see it yeah, it would have been it would have ended up being a little bit more formulaic it's like what's going on oh he can sense something it wouldn't have really worked like that's the only thing that i think the only thing <laughs> I could have been interesting is the fact that the doctor almost has to say, you know that I'm going to have to bring you back here because you need to, you need to fight in this war because you Mm -hmm. know it's going to happen. You're going to be coming back here at some point in time. And if hypothetically he like died out in, out on the adventures with the doctor, what ramifications that could have for the timeline, because he knows that this thing that should be a fixed point somehow doesn't happen. Yeah. Could be quite an interesting plot. I'm going to copy Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that the, I I think what really works throughout this two-parter is the underlying constant um, reminders of the fact that we are only in this episode a year away from World War One and the way they kind of hit home with a lot of that stuff regarding how the boys our feeling about fighting and regarding their emotional responses and how the doctor feels about fighting and all that kind of thing like they do it so well and the fact that he has a premonition about it being one minute past the hour and they get sort of bombed or what have you and i think yeah that would be the only storyline that they could really carry forwards with it is the fact that he would be running from the war but then i think we learn by the end of the episode that although he says yeah i'm a coward i always will be a coward to whatever that guy's name was i can't remember um he's not he's definitely not a coward he's not running from anything he's almost running into everything he's doing what he knows is right but what is the right thing for him to do looks like a cowardice from a war perspective um so if we have some spotify questions which is quite cool (laughs) Um, speaking of things going forwards, because we've got some stuff about companions and stuff about going forwards, 
Um, Oscar Scott asks, do we reckon that we should see a return of the Chameleon Arch and Pocket Watch, or do you think it would ruin how good the story was, like how Angel episodes were after Blink? And for me, Oscar, you hit the nail on the head there. If an episode works really well, and it's just a fantastic concept, and it's all nicely wrapped up, leave it be. Yeah, definitely. I really... Because... I don't think... Although... We have pocket watches and stuff do come back. Obviously, we've had it at the end of this series. It's happened in Flux, for God's sake. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. They did try and bring it back in Flux, and you know what? It just it's, fell on its ass because it's it Time meant Lord technology. Nothing. So I guess that it would be present. The fact that it was brought back again in the same series anyway is a very clever um, yeah, introduction spoilers. to the concept. Like, if. Martha had whipped out Yana's pocket watch and we wouldn't have known anything better. We'd have been like, no. it's yeah, a watch, yeah. big whoop. Um, but that, that concept is like the, the the pocket watch, the idea of being able to hide a consciousness within something. It, it was a lighthouse, for God's sake, for the mm-hmm. Fugitive Doctor. Yeah. Like that was a clever, That it kind of comes back to some extent, but I think doing the same kind of thing again, it's such a sort of specific concept you couldn't really re-explore mm. it without it drawing loads of parallels to without it just being blood. the same thing basically yeah. um, it's a really clever idea but, but i don't just, think it would work being brought back i think the problem with chibnall trying to do it in flux is that he probably saw something that was such a great concept at the time which russell wrote that worked really well that i mean correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think many people super disliked this serial um, I think it's a very, very, yeah. very, very good one. Well, it's in my one opinion, of the best I think of this it's series. really good. Mm-hmm. Um, so he probably saw something that done well and just went, I'm going to use an idea from that. And he just kind of crapped it out on the floor and left it in a steaming pile of turd. I mean, <laughs> we're going to see how things pan out with that pocket watch going into the finale of Jodie's series. But yeah, it doesn't feel as well thought out as it what has been here in the same way. It, kind of, it sort of was for the end of series three which we're going to get to in a couple of episodes time mm-hmm. um i was gonna go down a certain direction oh yes uh Davrossi, or funeral gay on wow. twitter yeah incredible I know. name um in a kind of similar way in a similar vein how do you feel if the species came back and do you think it's possible oh what the family yeah nah no they're done i mean pretty the whole, much the same feeling yeah the whole point of the end of the episode is that we wanted to live forever and we got it and now we're trapped at no point does it feel like we need to have them back no not at all it's it's not relevant and as much as we have returning enemies in doctor who because of the series that's gone on so long there's always that inherent possibility of bringing the characters bringing old enemies back and Mm -hmm. it doesn't need to happen every time sometimes it is the worst thing to do and I'll always stand by it as much as Village of the Angels in series 13 was actually pretty good. Mm-hmm. The Angels should not should not have gone any further than Blink. No, definitely Which we'll not. get to next time, fun fact. Hey. Um, same sort of thing. Um, uh, species coming back. There was another question that was very similar and it's in a kind of similar vein, I think. Um, Jackie Chan on Spotify asked the same thing if the family could come back one day pretty much the same uh, yeah, the same, same feeling answer. Spanner on Spotify asked about would we, whether we'd like to see more of Joan Redfern um, um, I am unsure I probably in the same way I think I, I was no. going to say the exact same thing it's like Joan's story has been and gone we don't mm-hmm. need any more of her would it and be interesting so... to have her crop up again? Maybe. But her her storyline, her arc is so specific to that mm-hmm. story. There's nothing really beyond it. And she's so well executed that I feel like if you brought her back, it would just be do, doing her a disservice, her character a disservice. Because yeah. she's just so excellent at being the whole package that she is in this episode mm-hmm. that yeah i think any other writing for her would almost diminish her yeah i mean we do kind of see her back again because jessica hines returns as verity newman mm-hmm. in the end of time part two is this like as this descendant of her who wrote a book based on the journal that she kept after john smith left and obviously uh, Verity Newman is a reference to Verity Lambert and Sydney Newman, which, funnily enough, is who John Smith's parents are. Mm-hmm. Parent, dad called Sydney, mother called Verity. And if you knew that, 
before I said to you that it was Sidney Newman and Verity Lambert, the original c- c- conceiver. Is that the right word? Conceptualist. Conceptual, yeah. Person who I'm conceived sure. the idea of Doctor Who in the first place and the first producer of Doctor Who. Um, then you get you get extra points. Well done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Katie on Spotify asks, why is this the best analysis of the Doctor's character? Oh, I and mean, I think we've, we've dived we've into just that been quite over a lot. That really, yeah. and it's a very good question. And if we haven't basically already answered it throughout the entirety of this podcast, I would say, basically, refer to previous 55 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's It's bang on exactly that. Um, like it's, yeah, it's it's definitely the, definitely the most interesting approach to looking at the Doctor in a mirror because mm-hmm. it's done through the perspective of the Doctor. Yeah, basically. yeah. Um, I hope that's okay that, that we've just kind of answered your question <laughs> without answering your question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of the Doctor, so Ben Kellett's on Spotify and also I've just closed the bloody window. Oh, Richard! Ah, damn it! It's all right. I've got it back. Um, and also, uh, whereabouts? is it adam busby on twitter said basically the same thing about whether we thought the doctors um the dark side of the doctor whether the punishments for the family were too harsh uh yeah it's i mean i don't know i think it's one of the only times really that you see the doctor punish somebody in this kind of manner you don't ever really see him prolong anybody's suffering if he doesn't have to but i think the reason why he treats them the way he treats them is because of everything that he's lost within this episode basically turns his not turns his anger because he is obviously inherently angry deep down but they basically rile him up a little bit and they kind of you know, they've taken away this life he could have had as John Smith. They've taken away the love that he could have had. They've taken away his future family. You know, they've caused deaths where there didn't need to be and all for the sake of wanting to live forever. And I think the fact that she, that Joan reads to the end of the book and she says, if you don't do this, there will be constant destruction everywhere they go because they will breed, they will multiply, they will create families all over the universe where they destroy everything um i think he's basically just using that anger that he feels at having lost a lot more than he bargained for during this time he was basically just kind of hoping that they would exist for three months and then die like he'd planned on it um because they would just die of natural causes because it was the end of their lifespan. And yet that doesn't happen. And so much comes in the wake of them, not of that, of the repercussions of their existence that, yeah, I think it's, I think the reason that he does it is understandable, but at the same time, I'm also, not sure he would have done it in any other circumstances if that makes sense yeah i think i think kind of echoing what you said it's i think it's more down to the collateral Mm -hmm. this was beef between the family and the doctor and the doctor obviously hid to prolong his life and he was powerless as john smith to stop them sooner but because of all of the deaths that happened alongside like they were they wrote everybody in to try and coerce the doctor out not really understanding how the mechanics of this whole situation that the doctor that john smith found himself in would work Mm -hmm. but i think because of all the collateral and then as you said the fact that this this person john smith lost this life he could have had plus all the people that literally lost their lives over this he was like well do you know what screw you guys i'm angry you guys want to you guys (laughs) want to live forever you can live forever Mm -hmm. at the end of the day the doctor gives you a chance and it's a bit of a different one because of how he knows how dis- how destructive it could have been if they'd gotten his his ability his biology yeah um so he wasn't just in a position to remain as he is and give them that opportunity but you know as we say the doctor gives you a chance if you refuse that he will not hesitate but also i don't think any of them were particularly cruel 
punishments because none of them actually get hurt during their punishments. Like, I okay, think yeah, it's because he's bound in that... chains and she falls yeah. into a part of space, but they all live forever, just constantly going through. So it's less of a physical pain and more of a mental anguish. So I think he basically just kind of wanted to even the playing field. Pretty much. And that that leads on quite well to Hannah Schilling's question about who we thought got the worst punishment out of the family. Oh. Hmm. I'm... Oh. I think the young girl got the best, if I'm honest. Do you think? Yeah, because she's in every mirror ever. So she can live in all corners of the world. And although she's trapped in a mirror, she still gets to kind of exist in every plane whereas he is literally forced to be a scarecrow and not move from that spot she's constantly falling into a dark pit of space and he is chained up and never gets to move you see i i almost think the flip side of that maybe that's me reading into it a bit too much but you almost i i don't obviously i don't i can't know this for for a fact because i've not been in that position but Mm -hmm. three of the four family maybe not son of mine because he's a scarecrow and he'll see people about they will basically get to be that they, they're almost completely alone mm-hmm. whereas the daughter she sees everything happening mm. and not that she would want to be involved in like a social kind of way but she gets to see life happening the others don't as like the mother and the father absolutely not but no, the, son, the scarecrow maybe, but, kind of does but as the daughter because she gets as you say she gets to see everything happening it's like the whole universe could burn and die and the like, you know arguably three of the family were no no different mm-hmm. whereas the daughter gets to see life and freedom happen right before her very eyes and she will never get to touch it again she can see it mm. but she can't have it whereas you'd almost get in that position i i'd almost rather have the solace in not knowing yeah, I suppose so. So I would I would argue that the daughter maybe got the worst because she gets to see all the stuff she can't have. Mm, and also the doctor the visits, visits her once a year and basically just, just reminds her of her in. torment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Yeah. So mm. that's, yeah, we've got... It's nice we have different answers to these sorts of questions, yeah. isn't it? Um, so what else have we got? What else have we got? Uh... The other thing, uh, there's, okay, so there's a couple things about Martha mm-hmm. we need to talk about. So SJ Gather Cole, that might be completely wrong. Apologies anyway, for his. Um, they say that I always felt this episode was where Martha really comes into her own. But do we think it was maybe a little late on in the series and maybe should have come earlier? Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of said that, didn't we? That this is the point where off-screen Martha has really come into her own and in this episode you really see her take charge. Um, yeah. I don't know. I I think Martha's one of those people that looking back on everything she does, there hasn't ever really been a point where I feel like she's missed a beat. Now, there are obviously times when she makes a few errors here and there and she's not perfect and the doctor obviously needs to tell her to do this, that and the other. But I think she's far more willing to kind of jump into the centre of things and do things for herself and be that strong, independent um, character than a lot of the companions that we see. Um, So, yeah, maybe they could have given her a bit more knowledge earlier on in the series, but I think that's also... That also kind of shows the difference in the length of time that she is with the Doctor compared to how Rose was with the Doctor because we forget that Rose was with the Doctor for years um, off screen as well as on. I mean, on screen it was two years, but off screen, God knows how long it would have been, probably three or four. Um, And so she very much gets the opportunity to evolve. I think we saw Rose evolve quicker because she was there was more cut out of Rose's timeline off screen, if that makes sense. So there was more, there was almost more to build yeah. from Rose comparatively to Martha. Whereas Martha comes into it late because she's with him for a much shorter period of time. And so we see more of that happen on screen and you get more kind of progress of how she develops. And so you very much see the realistic side to the, to her character of her having to 
become this person so i don't know that it should have come any earlier because i think if it did it would have almost alluded to the ellipsis of time being more um yeah it would have felt being... a bit more higgledy piggledy yeah. the actual like progression of her uh-huh. character i mean kind of echoing that i think if it came earlier it would almost feel like she's been dropped into the deep end too much as you said she was this strong character from the offset you know she was thrown fully in the deep end in the first place anyway but something on this kind of level having to literally fend for herself in the 1910s yeah that's that's a lot to ask of a character i think if you threw a companion in that position that like early on in the series like in the first third of the series you'd almost i'd almost question its success Mm -hmm. i would i'd argue that if this happened to rose by dalek for example by episode six yeah no they would have lost i mean the the thing is we saw rose in dalek and even she was stupid enough to like well not stupid enough obviously she didn't know any but she wasn't she wasn't wasn't the rose we know now yeah no and that's the thing i think you you're right i think if had martha been dropped into this any earlier and they would have lost wholeheartedly lost nothing would have you know but yeah yeah. but i do still understand what i'm gonna say cole what cole means about it coming potentially a bit late because Martha's only got four episodes left or mm-hmm. technically only three because she's barely in next time. Yeah. Um, it, it's a it's a big move for her character, as we've discussed. And yeah, it, it feels like it could have been a bit earlier. Obviously, the beauty of these episodes are they could, they're almost a bit choppy changey. The only thing we'll have to do is, I think it's in 42 where Doctor gives her the key. Mm-hmm. Might be before it then. Is. But either way, like, yeah they have to kind of go next to each other because she then has a TARDIS key. Yeah. Um, as much as you could probably read into it as like, well, if the Doctor was going to do this, he would have inevitably inevitably given her a key if she hadn't already had one. But anyway, um, it's it's a quick series for Martha. Mm-hmm. Um, it sets her up very well for what's to come for her next like proper serial, which is after Blink, because mm-hmm. it's a Doctor companion light story. So we'll get to that. But that leads on, interestingly, into a question from Matthew on... Uh, on Spotify. And he says that these episodes are the sources of Twitter controversies, which is oh. interesting because I've, ne- I've never seen any. Not to say that I'm saying they're lying. No. But anyway, um, about whether or not it's a good or bad representation of racism. How well does this episode portray racism in your opinion? I mean, it's always going to be a difficult topic to touch on. And, uh, you know, it's... It's another one of those, oh, Doctor Who's gone all woke and political in the recent kind of well, era of Jodie, you know, and all that kind of If it had aired rubbish. today, then more people would have pointed it out. More people would have pointed it but out. It, but like, I think this was 2007. Where Twitter didn't, that did Twitter exist of, in 2007? I don't think it did. I, I think, think it was 2009 did. it came out. Uh, way. So anyway, something like that. But to put it in, from my opinion, I think it handles it quite well. Because yes. historically... In 1913, black people, coloured people were treated as much lower. They were the help. They were staff. They were not people to be uh, listened to. You know, obviously, I'm not talking... I don't have much historical knowledge and I cannot sit here and claim that I know much about racism in history because I don't. But as far as I'm aware, they portrayed it realistically enough that it was mentioned a few times throughout the episode in the the men well i mean first of all women for a start were sort of a lower rank than men anyway hence why it's an all boys school and you don't see any women there apart from like staff apart from the Um, the matron and the maids yeah that's basically it they're the only three women you see in this entire sort of uh school but i think it she mentions it early on when they're scrubbing the floor and obviously you get that guy who says with hands like those etc etc which you know i think as disgusting as it is for him to say something like that it probably that would have been that's how it was and yeah. that doesn't mean it's right in any way shape or form but it would be silly of us to ignore the fact that historically racism was inherent in society and so i think it handles it quite well because it doesn't allude to the fact that it's right in any way shape or form russell the way he's written the episode wait did russell write this episode russell didn't write it no sorry whoever in paul paul cornell paul the way paul cornell handles 
rebuttaling that racism with Martha's character, I think, is what works here because she never bows same. down Russell to it. Russell has done the same. Yeah. All the all the writers of Doctor, even Chibnall, has done the same thing. Yeah. They've managed to, as you say, it's a taboo subject, but there's something about. Um, I think there's two sides to it. Some people probably don't like it being acknowledged because it's like it's being portrayed in such a way that it's like this is not okay. By mm-hmm. the way, you might think that you know when when racism is pointed out in some media, people obviously do they pull the woke card because if you ever complain about something being woke, it's just basically a free speech quote unquote free speech way of saying I'm a massive racist. Yeah, or um, I'm a massive bigot of some description. Exactly, um, <laughs> but they do it because it's 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 almost. It's it's right to acknowledge it because it happened. Mm-hmm. It's as simple as that. Like it, there's there's something about looking back at a time like that where something like that when you've got a companion like Martha, when you've got a companion like Bill, yeah, in Thin Ice when they go back to Victorian London, you know, that's that's how things were. Mm. You've got um you've got Ryan in the nineteen, what was it? I can't 50s, remember. 40s? What, for Rosa um, Parks? With Rosa Parks. Was, yeah, and I can't he remember. And get, him getting slapped. Like, this, that happened. Mm-hmm. And it would it would feel, as much as it's hard-hitting, it would feel wrong if it didn't happen. Yeah. If they pretended like everything was fine. Because you do find there are some media that do lean into that whole, like, let's kind of pretend it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. You, you know, obviously I work in video games. It's the thing that I do. And when you have, like... As an example, you've got things like Call of Duty and Battlefield, but it's like, here's a black female soldier fighting alongside everyone else. It's like, yeah, but really? Mm. Like that kind of, I know that obviously, you know, I don't know, as in the same way you have, I can't quote history to you. I don't yeah. know whether that was very true or not, but there is that element of, but that doesn't seem representative Accurate. of the time. Yeah. Whereas sometimes with something like Doctor Who as much as it's that whimsical show when they pull it back to to the reality mm-hmm. they're in it makes the suspension of disbelief so much easier yeah it's because very grounding there are, there are aspects of the time we're looking at that pull you back into that you're not in a fantasy parallel world where yeah you know black Aliens women can work in a school in 1913 and everyone's absolutely okay with it and will never have any comments put to them being woman or being a woman or being black or anything mm-hmm. so but I, I think I, in I'm a way... I'm intrigued about... Sorry. <laughs> no, after you. After you. After I think you. in a way what it does so well, though, being in Doctor Who and being acknowledged through the script and the time period is that it teaches the kids that are watching in a kind of subconscious way that Martha is an incredible person and you see that develop throughout sort of her travels with the Doctor and the fact that she shows up Joan by listing all of the bones in the human hand and things and says that she's studying to be a doctor it teaches kids that really it doesn't matter who you are like what color you are who like literally anything about you does not change the fact that you can be an incredible person and you can fight things that are inherently wrong and I think the way she talks to Jenny when obviously the guy comments on her skin colour when she's scrubbing the floor and the way she says, like, I'd like to whack a bucket round his head is more poignant to the fact that she's like, I'm aware of the colour of my skin because she points at herself, doesn't he? And Jenny says, oh, yeah, being a Londoner or something. And I think that, like, joke is there to kind of ease you into the fact that they're going to, like, mention the fact that she's, you know, a servant and she's coloured and this kind of thing. But I think it does it really well in the fact that it teaches kids subconsciously that this is not okay, that Martha is standing up for herself and being the person that we know her to be, which is a great human being. Um, And it's only really mentioned a few, a handful of times. And to be honest, 90% of the time, they're more just remarking the fact that she is a maid and not black. Um, Yeah. Because they obviously talk to her and be like, oh, your maid is talking to me again. Like, how dare she kind of thing. But that's just because that was a woman's role at the time as well. Um, Yeah. So, yeah, all in all, I think it does it very well. I think if it had done it any less so, it would have just lent too much into the, oh, we're just going to pretend everything's okay. And if it did any more, it would have almost overshadowed the rest of the narrative, which is already, there's a lot to pick, there's a Mm -hmm. lot to take in. Um, Obviously, I was about to say, you know, they could have made that, that aspect more of a, a relevant part of the narrative which obviously with something like an episode like rosa it very much did didn't do it very well because Can't, rosa yeah. was as much as the setting was very very good the acting was brilliant 
the all of the, the elements except the, the, alien the representation in Rosa were great. Was the, the way that they did not hang back, they didn't hold back from what happened mm-hmm. to Rosa Parks. But then the whole alien side of it was complete rubbish. Yeah, they didn't need that. So <laughs> anyway, like yeah. But the thing I'm intrigued about, and this is maybe something that Matthew could, you know, shed some light on, is I'm intrigued about what controversy that kind of that would bring. Mm. Like I, I'm not trying to like call you out here matthew at all i'm just i'm ju- i've not no, seen any kind of generally like, intrigued, i've never seen yeah. this facet of this this singular aspect of doctor who in this episode to be like this is a problem and it's like but why mm-hmm. is it a problem when the doctor peter capaldi punches that dude in the face because he starts mouthing off at bill because she's black mm-hmm. do we have the doctor kicking up a stink about that american dude slapping ryan you know that's that's how it is so yeah and I, I i respect the show more when it wants to be daring. Mm-hmm. Not only if they want to scare the crap out of kids, it's the thing I think Doctor Who's missing. I, w- I want, as much as it's different being, you know, we're, we're 27 now watching this show I from be 15 scared, years ago. Bro. I want something I to be not, not overtly scare me, but to make me go, okay, that's actually quite scary. Mm-hmm. In the same way that we look back, we watch back Empty Child. We watch back Blink mm-hmm. and we go, Christ alive this would have, if I if I were 10 I would be crapping myself and right to now. be fair when we were 12 I basically had to hide behind the sofa for blink because I physically exactly. couldn't control myself yeah like that's that's when it's daring in that regard but also when it's daring to be like this is how it was you know this is here's here's everybody dying in Pompeii mm-hmm. here's people being treated differently because of their gender or the color of their skin it's we have like, to acknowledge it because that's it happened. when doctor who is at its best because if we don't acknowledge that it happened and we don't learn from it then we're never going to evolve as a society basically so and i'll say it before and i'll say it again if you complain about that sort of stuff being woke be it because you're watching re-watching this old series now or you're watching doctor who at the moment if you that's the kind of complaint you have the show is not for you yeah and See you yeah later. neither is this podcast so if you're racist exactly. homophobic or sexist please stop listening now i won't miss you exactly but <laughs> thankfully from what we've seen from you lot in, in the comments in the questions and stuff you guys are all pretty much on the same page and we really appreciate that but i think that about wraps up our chat about human nature and the family of blood mm-hmm. and it's a long thank one you all for yeah it was thank you all for the questions on twitter and on spotify so again if you do listen on spotify have a look at the uh the question look at look at the episode page on the spotify page on your app or on browser or whatever and you should see like a q a thing it says there's a question and it will say something about blink because mm-hmm. that's what's coming next blink. If you got any questions for us put them in the the question q a responses thing on spotify or you can tweet us at castapod on twitter or you can put it in the comments of the video if you're watching this or listening to this on, on youtube youtube but Blink is next, and I know yes. that we're gonna pick, we're gonna dig into this even more uh, come next time. But I'm gonna have to say it because it's exciting. It's probably the best episode of New Who. Oh, it's one Overall. of them for sure. I mean, would you compare it to Dalek and say that that's uh, it beats Dalek? Dalek is very high up for me, but yeah. I think Blink is probably a notch higher. If, you had to, if I had to do a ranking of the best episodes of New Who, it would be Blink and then Ooh, Dalek and then wow. probably Amy's Choice. Oh, I love so, Amy's Choice. Oh, can't so, wait till we get to Amy's Choice. <laughs> that's only Series 5, so it's oh my not God, is it? too far away. I love yeah, Amy's Matt Choice. Smith's first series. But yeah, So, excited. yeah, that's going to that's gonna be next time. We're going to watch some Blink, so do not blink, blink and you're dead, etc, etc, etc. But... Uh, I really do appreciate all of you. I say yes. I. We really we. appreciate all of yeah, you. Yeah, I'm here for too. Listening. Thanks. Yeah, Amy's here too. It's not just me here. I wouldn't want it to be just me here. As much as I probably could sit and talk about Doctor Who by myself, I'd rather do it with you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Don't don't take that as being cute. Yeah, That's, it is cute no. though. Stop. Where, <laughs> anyway, where can they find well, you on the socials, Ames? <laughs> um, you can find me on Instagram at Ames underscore Elizabeth. You can find me on Instagram and the Twitter at Pickup Change Toe. And again at castapod on twitter mm-hmm. if you want to send us questions for blink but that's going to be next time by the time you're listening to this i'm going to be in le mans yeah you are so it won't it'll, it'll be a while i'm going to watch fast cars and french people um by so the time you listen the, to this i'm going to be sat at home lonely by myself 
enjoy <laughs> yes it's gonna be it's gonna be at least like two weeks until the next episode but uh we really do appreciate your patience and we appreciate all of you who come and listen to this when we see the stats of the the number of people that listen to this podcast we are genuinely blown away each and every yeah, time genuinely makes so us so happy thank you so much and for thank bearing you with us for all anybody who sends us a message ever like to say yes i'm really excited for your like thank you you know just any kind of i i really enjoy people messaging me and saying you know i really enjoy your podcast thank you so much for recording etc etc it's just really nice to see that you genuinely are out there because when we're recording we're literally just talking to each other over it a screen does. we don't get that interaction and as much as we are talking to you right now in the past we're currently talking to you in the future and we don't know you exist yet so it's Time a bit trouble. of a timey wimey wibbly wobbly timey wimey which we'll get to next time as well um but yeah, it's really, really nice when people say, you know, I really enjoyed the podcast. Thank you so much, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. Shout that's out nice. to Oscar. Thank you for that message on Instagram. Really, yeah. really appreciate it, mate. So yeah, either send us questions or send us messages or something. Or one of the do you two. Want, do, you want, do you want a lunch dinner egg t-shirt? Because I've got one designed. <laughs> it's been sitting in my, on my PC for ages. If you it genuinely has. want it. Yeah, share the podcast. <laughs> I'll take that as share share the podcast if I get that's not payment smash smash the smash the like button if I get a thousand <laughs> likes for those no, uh, 69,420 likes on this podcast I'll uh, release a t-shirt how about just 69 I'm hip and down with the kids yo mm, subscribe <laughs> exactly. if you haven't smash already smash that like button and, <laughs> and make subscribe. sure your bell is turned on for notifications Lol. don't uh, this is my literal job I know it don't. is <laughs> <laughs> and on that bombshell Thank you all so much for listening. We'll see you next time for Blink. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next time. Bye! Bye.